The Q presents On the Ground. Hello everyone, welcome to Silicon Angle's The Cube on the ground here at Oracle's headquarters. I'm John Furrier, the host of The Cube, and I'm here with Neil Mendelson, who's the Vice President of Product Management for the Big Data team at Oracle. Welcome to On the Ground. Thanks for having us here at the headquarters. So Big Data, obviously a big focus, Oracle Open World is right around the corner, but in general, the Big Data breadth of products from Oracle has been around for a while. What's your take on this? Because Oracle is doing very well with this new cloud story. When I interviewed Mark Hurd, 100% of the code has been cloudified. Big data now is a big part of the cloud dynamic. What are some of the things that you're seeing out in the marketplace around big data and where does Oracle fit? Well, you know, when this whole big data thing started years ago, I mean, Hadoop just hit its 10th anniversary, right? Everybody was talking about throwing everything out, you know, that they had and there was no reason for SQL anymore and, you know, you're just going to, you know, throw a bunch of stuff together yourself and put it together and off you go, right? And now I think people have realized that uh, to get the real value out of these new technologies, it's not a question of just the new technologies alone, but how do you integrate those with your existing estates? So Oracle obviously is a big database business, you know, I mean, Tom Curry, well, hey, you know, the database, take your swim lane. But what, what's interesting is with Hadoop and some of these other ecosystems, what customers are looking for is to not just use Oracle databases, but to use whatever they might see as a feature of some use case. Hadoop Absolutely. for batch. So you guys have been connecting these systems. So can you just quickly explain for a minute how you guys look at this choice factor from a customer standpoint, because there's a role for Hadoop, but Hadoop isn't going to take over the whole world as we see in, in the ecosystem. What's your role vis-a-vis -vis the database choice? Yeah, so we very much believe, you know, when you know, Oracle started, it was all about database and it was all about SQL. And we believe now that the new normal is really one that includes both Hadoop, NoSQL, and relational, right? SQL is of course still a factor, but so are the ability to interface in via REST interfaces and scripting languages. So for us, you know, it's really a big tent. And we've been taking what we had done previously in database and really extending that to data management over Hadoop and NoSQL. We had a great chat at Oracle Open World last year, and you talked about your history at Oracle before you did your run with startups. You've seen this movie go on early days with data warehousing. So I got to ask you, big data is not new to Oracle. Obviously the database mm -hmm. business has been thriving and changing with the cloud around the corner and certainly here on the doorstep. But could you explain Oracle's database, I mean, a big data product offerings. Sure. Where, what was the first product? Take us through the lineage of where it is, because you guys have product. We do. And a slew of stuff is coming. Mm -hmm. I can imagine, I'm sure you can't share much about that, but talk about the lineage right now. Okay, so we started about, you know, three years ago on the Hadoop side by making an appliance made for Hadoop and then uh, uh, in the future, uh, or which followed on with Spark. And that appliance has been doing well in the marketplace, you know, for a number of years and we've obviously continued to enhance that. We then took what we perfected on premises and we moved that up to the cloud. So we have a big data cloud service for customers that offer them you know, high performance access to Hadoop and Spark and you know, without the necessarily the, uh, the need to actually manage security and all the things with it, right? At Open World, we, we'll be making a series of announcements. We'll be creating yet another big data cloud service. This one will be fully managed, fully elastic for customers who only want to take advantage of a uh, Hadoop or Spark service, as an example, and don't want to deal with you know, the ability to uh, you know, specifically tweak the environment, right? We also uh, announced a little while ago uh, our family of cloud machines, right? So you'll see a, the first cloud machine is one that provides uh, Oracle uh, IAS and PaaS services, and then we'll add to the family. That's shipping already though. That's shipping already, okay. right? And then we'll add to the family an Exadata cloud machine and a big data cloud machine. And the cloud machines are really kind of a cool concept. They're cool because, you know, for a lot of customers, from a regulatory point of view or otherwise, they're just not ready for the public cloud. But everybody wants to take advantage of what the cloud provides. So how do you do that behind your firewall, right? How do you provide IT as a service? So what Oracle has done essentially is to package up its cloud services and able to deliver that to customers behind the firewall. And they get the exact same technology that they have on the public cloud 
they build to one architecture and then deploy it wherever they choose. They get the advantages of the cloud. Mm -hmm. It's a subscription service, right? Uh, but they can deal with, but uh, they can adhere to whatever data sovereignty or you know, issues that they mm -hmm. might have. So let's get to that regulatory dynamic in a second, but I want to just back up. So big data appliance, mm -hmm. BDA, you guys call it, yep. big data appliance, that's been out. Mm -hmm. Big data service. Cloud service, cloud, started about a year ago. About a year, that's out right. there. Those are basically connect appliance that's on-prem with the cloud. Right. And then now you have the cloud machine series of enhancements coming at Oracle Open World. Right, as well as a fully elastic, uh, fully managed cloud service that will add to the mix as well. Okay, so let's get down, so that's going to bring us fully cloud enabled, yep. cloud on premise, Both. all that kind of dynamic mm -hmm. flexibility and, and option for uh, configuration and, and provisioning. Okay, back to the regulatory thing. So why, what's the big deal about that? Because you mentioned that most companies we talk to love the cloud, they love the economics, but there's a lot of FUD and fear internally amongst their own team about you know, getting sued, losing data, you know, certain industries that they might have to play. So is that a factor? And can you explain that for someone? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, for, for some customers, it's a, it's a real concern, right? And the world is dynamically shifting. I mean, you know, look at what happened a few months ago with, uh, you know, the Brexit, right? I mean, it, all of a sudden it was okay to have, you know, the data as long as it was in the EU. Well, the EU is now shifting. So where does the data go, right? So from a regulatory point of view, we haven't fully settled, right? In terms of where customers, where customer data can be held, uh, exactly how it's treated. And, you know, those things are evolving. So for a number of companies, they want the advantages of the cloud, but they don't necessarily want it on the public cloud, right? And that's why, you know, we are offering these new cloud machines because they can essentially have you know, their cake and eat it too. So interesting, the dynamic then is, is that this whole regulatory thing is a moving train right. relative to the whole global landscape. Right. Who knows what's going to happen with China and other things, right? Right, and, and I, I think that's what's really terrific is that, you know, our history is, of course, you know, we're a company that's been around for a while, so we started on premises. And we moved up to the cloud. And our customers are ones that are going to have kind of this hybrid kind of a system, right? Other companies started much later and they're cloud only. And you know, while that's great for companies that want the public cloud, what do you do if you're in a regulatory environment that isn't ready to be public cloud? You know, now you have to have two architectures, one for on-premises and one for cloud. And then how do you deal with a moving landscape where you know, a year from now, things that are on-premises can move to the cloud and other things that are in the cloud may have to move to back on-premises, right? How do you deal with that dynamic going forward and not get stuck? So, so is it fair to say that Oracle is a big data player in the cloud and on-premise? Absolutely, right? And not just for data management. I think that you know, while we started at that core, that's our heritage, we've so much built out our portfolio, right? We have big data products in the data integration space, in the machine learning space. We have big data products that uh, connect up with our IoT strategy, with uh, data visualization. You know, we've really blossomed uh, as the marketplace has matured, matured, bringing additional technology for customers to utilize. Okay, so let's get down to the reality and, and get into the weeds with customer deployments. Mm -hmm. How do you guys compare vis-a-vis -vis the competition? Now you got the on-prem with the BDA, big data appliance, mm -hmm. with cloud service, cloud machines to create some provisioning, you know, flexibility on whether architectures the customers may choose yeah. for whatever reason that they would have. Okay. How does that compare to the competition? Well, on the on-premise side, if we start there, there was a recent Forrester wave that looked at various Hadoop appliances and we took the number one category or the number one uh, position across all the three categories that they looked at. They looked at uh, uh, you know, the strategy, they looked at the market presence, and they looked at the capability of what we offered. And we ended up number one right, in that space. Uh, on the cloud side, of course, we're, uh, you know, we're maturing in terms of that offering as well, but you know, we're really the only company out there that can offer the same architecture, both on cloud and on premises where you don't necessarily have to go all in on one or the other, right? And for many companies, that's exactly what they're, you know, what they need, right? They can't necessarily go all in one way or the other. So I got to ask you kind of a, put your historical historian, tech historian hat on as well as your Oracle executive hat on and talk about some of the technologies that have come and gone over the years and how does that relate to some of the things that are hyped up now? I mean, certainly Hadoop was supposed to be yeah. this new industry, it's going to disrupt the database and Oracle's going to be put out of business and this is how people are going to store stuff, MapReduce, 
Now people are saying, why even have Hadoop in the cloud when you got object store? So, you know, there's, there's things come and go. I'm not saying Hadoop is going to come and go, but yeah. it's good for batch. But mm -hmm. so what's your comments on that? Can you point to industry technology and say, okay, that's going to be a, fe a feature of something else. That's a real deal. What are some of the things that you look at that you can so, see? So, you know, we're seeing exactly as you described, right? A few years ago, you go to a conference and it was all about MapReduce, right? Now, a seminar on MapReduce, nobody goes, right? Everybody's going to Spark, right? And there's already things that potentially replace, replace Spark, things like Flink. And we're going to see that continual change. And a lot of what we focused on is to be able to provide some level of abstraction, right, between the customer's architecture and these moving technologies. So I'll give an example. Um, our data integration technology, right? Historically, that was, you know, you're able to visually describe a set of transformations, and then we generated code in SQL or PL-SQL. Now, we generate code not only in SQL and PL-SQL, but we generate that same code in Spark, right? If tomorrow Spark gets replaced with Flink or something else, Right? We simply replace the code generator underneath and all of what the customer has built gets preserved and moved into the future. I think a lot of people are now becoming concerned that as they take advantage of open source really, really at the very low levels, they have the potential to essentially get stuck right, at, in a technology which has essentially become obsoleted. Right? Yeah. As any ne new technology evolves, we move from people who just code right, with all the lower li level stuff up to a set mm -hmm. of tools. And, you know, we talk to companies now that have huge amounts of now legacy MapReduce code, right? You, you think only a few years ago- Kind of like COBOL. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> It's going to be around, but not really pervasive. Right, so how can you, you know, take advantage of these technologies, right, without necessarily having to get stuck to any one of them? So we're going to ask you the philosophical question, or obviously Oracle database business has been the, the star over, over the years since the founding, but even now, mm -hmm. it seems to me that the role of the database becomes even more important as you connect subsystems, call it Hadoop, Spark, whatever technology is going to evolve, as a feature of an integrated system, if you will, software-based and mm -hmm. or engineered system coming together. So that seems to be obvious, that you can connect in an open way and give customers choice. But that's kind of different from the old Oracle. I have a database, everything runs on Oracle, Oracle and Oracle's great, certainly it runs well. But what's the philosophy internally? Obviously the database team sitting there it must be like, wow, big data is an opportunity for Oracle. That's right. Or do they go, well, no, the database business is, is you know, different. How do you guys talk about that internally and, and how do customers take away from that dynamic between the database crown jewel and the opening it up and being more Big well, I think it's ironic because externally, when you talk to people, they just assume that we're going to be like, oh my God, this is a threat and we're going to just, you know, double down on what we're doing on the database side and, you know, we're just going to hunker down and, I don't know, try to hide, right? But that's exactly the opposite of what we've really been doing internally, right? We really have embraced these technologies of Hadoop and Spark and NoSQL. And we're essentially seeing data management evolve. Right, that is the new normal. So rather than looking at, you know, as we might, not only we might have said, we did say when we introduced uh, Oracle uh, in the data warehousing market back in 95, we said, put all your data in the Oracle database. We're not saying that anymore, right? Because there are reasons to put data in Hadoop, there are reasons to put data in graph databases, in NoSQL databases. We need to be able to provide those choice Right, while still integrating that data management platform as one integrated entity. Would you say then it was fair to say that from a customer standpoint by having that open approach gives more faster access to different data types in real time? Absolutely. And isn't you that know, the core value proposition of big data? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, when the Hadoop craze first started, it was all about, you know, unload and put everything in this one store. Right. And for a lot of companies today, they still are faced with the, this conundrum which says, in order to analyze data, I have to put it all in one place. So that means that you have to move your operational data, you know, into the one place. You have to move your data warehousing stuff into one place, right? But then, at the same time, you mentioned real time. How do you get in the business of moving data from place A to place B on a constant basis while still being able to offer real time access and real time analytics? The answer is you yeah. can't. And, and the value of the data, the data capital, as we've been talking about at, at Wikibon, is an IoT piece of data from a turbine could have really big relevance to the system of record in another database, and that has to be exposed and 
and integrated quickly to surface some insight about right. the quality it's of the that. It's the thing that gives you context, right? Today what's going on is that we are getting all access to all these rich data sources and rich data types that we didn't have before, whether that's you know text information or information coming off sensors and the like. And the relevance of that information is when we combined it together with the corporate information, right? The stuff that we have in our existing systems to really reap the true benefit, right? How do you know, you know, when you get a log file, the log file doesn't have anything about the customer mm -hmm. in it. The log file just has a, you know, a number associating itself to a customer. You have to tie that together with the customer profile, which data which might not exist in Hadoop, maybe it's in a NoSQL store. And certainly the open source is booming with Oracle. You guys are actively involved in all the different open source ecosystems. Sure, you know, we, we you know, drive a number of open source projects, whether it's, you know, MySQL, or uh, Java, or you know, the list goes on and on. Many people don't think of, you know, they're not even aware that that Oracle's behind MySQL as an example, right? I mean, I remember talking to my son recently, and he says, you know, do you know anything about MySQL? You know, and I'm like, well, a little bit, right? <laughs> and then as we're talking and we're, you know, looking through his code, I finally say, you know, you know, this is Oracle product. He's like, no, it's not. Right, you know, because and, and it's too cool to be Oracle. That's right. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, yeah. the reality of it is, yeah. is that you know we've invested a whole yeah. lot of time and energy in these technologies, and we're really looking to commercialize them, to mainstream them, to make them less scary for more people to be able to get value from. Well, your son's example is a great ex in, uh, illustration of the new Oracle that's out there now. This whole new philosophy. Fine, I'll give you the last word real quick. For folks watching, um, what's one thing you'd want to share with them that they may or may not know about Oracle and its big data strategy? Give us a look, right? I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, when you think of big data and you think of these new technologies, you may not think of Oracle, right? You may think of the new companies that you're more familiar with and alike. The reality of it is, is that Oracle has an extraordinarily rich portfolio of technology and services on the cloud uh, as well as, you know, like cloud machines. So give us a look. I think you'll be surprised at how open we are, how much of the open source uh, technology we've embedded in our products, and how fast we're essentially evolving into, you know, what is the new normal. Neil, thanks so much for spending the time with me here on the ground. I'm John Furrier. You're watching exclusive on the ground coverage here at Oracle headquarters. Thanks for watching. Thank you.